I knew immediately at that moment something unthinkably wrong had just happened. Tonight on an all new 2020, TV's beloved dad and minister Stephen Collins on those outrageous headlines. We're all made of dark parts. An extraordinary confession just this week, only to Yahoo's Katie Couric. Did you have to fight? an urge to do this. His darkest sexual demons secretly recorded. There was one moment of touching. And stunning the public. Your fans are pretty devastated. Hashtag childhood ruined. Now, from seventh heaven to a living hell, what comes next? Are there any other women out there? Fall from grace. Plus, a family's worst nightmare when a SWAT team storms their home. They raided the wrong house. Smoke and chaos like this. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! Their little son, Boo Boo, seriously injured in the blast. This should never have happened. What did my son do to them? What went so horribly wrong? He did his job so badly that he nearly killed a child. Have the tactics changed? There's not going to be a real good answer to that one, is there? Now, with a million dollars in medical debt. This is just part of it. There's no Christmas until 2020 shows up. All I want for Christmas. And the nightmare before Christmas, when they didn't like his holiday lights, he turned into the Grinch, wrecking the halls instead of decking them. It almost sounds like you're a hostage in your own home. Tonight, they're getting scrooged. Here now, Elizabeth Vargas and David Muir. Good evening, and we start right off here tonight with those bombshell confessions straight from the headlines. That famous TV dad, actor Stephen Collins, coming forward for the first time. Why now? One tweet sums up the scandal. Reverend Camden, how could you? Tonight, the actor best known as the minister on 7th Heaven faces the camera for the first time, speaking only to our colleague, Yahoo Global anchor, Katie Couric. In a town notorious for its toxic breakups, few have been as bitter as the family feud between the actor Stephen Collins and his wife, Faye Grant. This morning, the scandal surrounding actor Stephen Collins gets uglier by the day. Married 29 years, they seem to be a Hollywood anomaly. The picture-perfect couple, but little did we know. I've always said this marriage is absolutely unfathomable. You think you understand someone else's marriage, nobody does. Nobody does. It's Opal, the Sapphire Center. A steady presence in both movies and television for the last we 40 years, Collins has played everything from a Nixon aide in All the, the President's Men. What happened on June 17th, I don't think the president knew anything about. To a straight-laced starship captain in Star Trek. Admiral Kirk. Oh, we're getting a top brass send-off. To Diane Keaton's estranged husband in the First Wives Club. Is that all you can do? Think of yourself, yourself, yourself. If you go through with this, I'll have nothing. But he's best known as Reverend Eric Camden, father of seven and pillar of the community for 11 seasons on the hit series, Seventh Heaven. I don't think God put you on hold. I think God brought you here. Off screen, he seemed to practice what he preached, volunteering at soup kitchens and serving communion at his local church. But beneath that squeaky clean image, Collins was hiding a secret. Did you feel at times that you were leading a double life in any way? Um, no, we're all made of dark parts and light parts. I, I know that other people are gonna judge and doubt and I can't do anything about that. All I can do is tell my truth. The story exploded this fall when TMZ released audio of Collins and his wife while they were undergoing marriage counseling. Audio that included admissions of his sexual misconduct with three underage girls decades ago. There was one instance. But how did you like, there was one instance what? Well, this isn't a disclosure and I told you before, there was one instance where for, there was one moment of touching. Unbeknownst to Collins, Faye had secretly recorded every disturbing word. When did you realize she was wearing a wire? She took me into a stairwell and she told me there, she revealed that, she said, I recorded, I was wearing a wire. I recorded that session. And she said, here's our settlement. You're gonna sign it now uh, or this, that recording is going to find its way to the media. 
Grant denies being the source of the leak, but the fallout was fast and furious. He was dropped from a recurring role on ABC Scandal, ironically, and fired from the set of the soon-to-be-released comedy, Ted 2. He played a sweet, sympathetic reverend on television, but now, in real life, he's accused of being a monster. The news about that sordid recording instantly destroyed a reputation he had spent decades building and publicly branded him as a sexual predator. The first incident was in 1973. You were 25 years old. How old was the victim? She was 10. Tell us what happened. Well, in 1973, there were two occasions when I exposed myself to this young woman. And several months later, she came to visit, and she and I were watching TV alone together, and I took her hand and moved it in such a way that she was touching me inappropriately. I knew that something unthinkably wrong had just happened that I couldn't take back, and I, I think we both just sat there. We really didn't move a muscle. And after about what I recall is about 45 seconds, I took her hand and moved it back. I waited a couple of minutes because I just didn't know what to do or say. And then I got up and left the room. But a decade later, in the same year he met his wife on the set of Tales of the Gold Monkey, he says it happened again. There were two times in 1982, when 20 years ago in 1994, when I, it's really, <clears throat> I exposed myself to two different teenage girls. There was no physical contact of any kind with either of them. Do you remember the look on these girls' faces? The look on the one in 1982 was such that it immediately just stopped everything cold. It was clear that she was disoriented and frightened, and that just made me want to stop and cover up, and I did. How old were, were these girls in 1982 and 1994? They were 13 and 14. Did you find this sexually gratifying? Not at all. I mean, not at all. It was not exciting. It was not gratifying. There was no gratification. Then why did you do it? It was a combination of poor impulse control, arrogance, 25-year-old arrogance. When was the first moment you realized that you had these impulses, an attraction to prepubescent or underage no. girls? No, that, that's the thing, and I absolutely do not have that attraction. I, have, I, I am not attracted to underage girls. Keep in mind that the only time there was any physical contact with an underage girl was in 1973. And uh, the incident in 1982, um, God help me, took, took advantage. That's not the right word, but I... I acted impulsively again. I think taking advantage may be Well, it, maybe it is term. exactly the right word. Are you a pedophile? I do not fit the either clinical or dictionary definition of it, but I'm absolutely not attracted, physically or sexually attracted to children. Never tempted? No. Never had the urge? That seems sort of weird to me. If this is a pattern of behavior that you could go for several years and not have that inclination. Because I didn't walk around thinking, oh boy, I could do something now, but no, I'm not going to. I, I don't white knuckle this. This is not something I'm, I'm not fighting with. It's not like if I miss therapy next week, something's gonna happen. Are there any other women out there? No. No one else is going to come forward and say, this happened to me in 1987. I can't guarantee what someone might do, but I can tell you that if they were doing that, it would not be truthful.
For the past 20 years, he says he's been in intensive therapy, which has included therapeutic workshops, religious counseling, and a 12-step program. And in discussing that difficult journey of self-discovery, Collins speculates that something he experienced in his own childhood may have contributed to his behavior. Have you figured out any other reason why you would do, do this repeatedly? The, the thing that makes the most sense to me, and it's not an excuse, because none of this is an excuse, but I did have someone in my life when I was between the ages of about 10 and 15, a, an older woman, who repeatedly exposed herself to me. And I think that that distorted my perception in such a way that some part of me thought, because I never felt like I was molested, it never occurred to me that word never crossed my mind as a 10 to 15 year old boy. It was, it was a very intense experience. But I think somewhere in my brain, I got the equation of, well, this isn't so terrible. I mean, this person who I trust uh, is, is doing it. When a woman exposes herself, what are you referring to? She lifted her shirt. What, do, what does that mean exactly? Um, being in various states of undress or complete undress. And this happened on several occasions? Yes, quite a few times. That may elicit some eye rolls by people listening to this. Oh, okay, this is why he did that. It's not why I did it. I'm not, I'm not blaming her. I'm just saying I think that's an aspect that went into my own distorted thinking as a young man. I'm trying to understand exhibitionism sort of mm. as a pattern. Is it about power? Is it about seeing someone shocked? Um, what, what motivates it? I think it is about power, but not consciously. Um, there's a statement that says, figuring it out is the booby prize. Now that sounds odd. What that means to, to a lot of people in recovery is you can figure it out, you can intellectually understand it, but what's important is what your behavior is. Uh, I'm still in regular therapy, I always will be, out of respect for those women, and it's just not going to happen again, and it hasn't. And, and I feel very confident that it won't. Until now, Collins has kept a low public profile, avoiding all questions about the scandal and his nasty divorce. Tonight, in a statement to Yahoo News, Faye Grant said, Stephen's statements about me are false and appear to be an attempt by him to deflect from his conduct. I sincerely hope Stephen gets the help he needs. Why did you want to do this interview? The truth, as painful as it is, is less painful than the stuff that was flying around the internet and some of the rumors. The former Reverend Camden may have fallen from grace, but he says he's constantly atoning for the harm he caused three young girls years ago. I think of those women every day. And I would say, with all my heart, I am sorry for what I put you through. And I want you to know that nothing like that will ever happen again. In real life, I know that you're a person of faith. Has this made you lose faith or has it made your faith stronger? In the church, Christ says in so many ways, bring me that which about you which is broken. Bring it. I'm a human being. I have faults and I've done things that I deeply regret, but I also know that I have a really good heart and um, that in spite of these things, uh, it, it, that I'm a good man trying to be a better man. While the statute of limitations has expired on any criminal charges against Collins, there remains an open investigation in New York City. So what do you think? Despite his apology and his loss of income, should he be held accountable in some way? We're on Facebook and on Twitter live throughout tonight's show, so let us know what you think. Use the hashtag ABC2020. When we come back here tonight, we're going to switch gears, a different headline, the Christmas that almost didn't happen. A SWAT team blasting into one family's home, their baby's remarkable recovery because of what happened inside. We'll be back. Next, we're playing Santa. Here's our tree. Oh my God! Yeah! 
for a family decimated when a SWAT team raided their home by accident and their baby was horribly injured. We should not be sitting here right now. What did my son do to them? Now, who's gonna pay their million dollars in medical bills? Sure is easy for law enforcement to hurt people and get away with it in that area, isn't it? You got a question? You bet it is. Coming up. Imagine the horror of this. Your family asleep in your home, being blasted awake by an explosion. Not a gas or electrical accident, but a police SWAT team targeting your house with your baby inside, barely two years old. And right now at Christmas, there's a million dollar medical bill. So who's going to pay, literally? Here's Matt Gutman. What's Christmas without a treat? Here's our tree. But one family in Wisconsin had the holiday cheer blasted right out of them this year. Enter 2020. So the family knows that I'm coming, but they have no idea what I'm bringing with me. We didn't know if you guys would have a Christmas tree, so we brought a couple of things, including this tree. Honey! And a bunch of toys. Instead of a sack of toys in? this year, yeah! Alicia and Boonkum Phone 7 are stuck with this sack of bills. I mean, this is just part of it, and these aren't, these are just the doctor's bills. It's been a tough year. Last spring, their house burned down, so they sought refuge with family in Georgia. Two parents and four young children crammed into a relative's garage. They thought they were secure until one night last May when an explosion jolted them out of sleep. Just boom. I didn't know what was going on. I knew that. There had been an explosion. At about 2 a.m., a fully armored SWAT team rammed down the door looking for a local drug dealer. Instead, they found a family with four small children. An officer had thrown in a flashbang grenade to stun everyone inside. Boo started screaming. But it landed right in the crib where Alicia's youngest child, 18-month-old Boo Boo, was sleeping. Then... My son starts screaming and I, I just go for him and the other officer grabs him first and I never even got to see his face. Officers whisked Boo Boo away in an ambulance, but they told his parents he was fine. I kept asking, you know, where is he? What happened? And your son just lost a tooth. He's okay. They just took him for observation. Your son just lost a tooth? When they finally arrived at the hospital to take their baby home, a social worker finally told them the truth. She told me that our son was in the, the burn trauma unit, and I, I, I lost it. The flashbang grenade had blasted holes in his face and his torso. Doctors said Boo Boo might not survive. It seemed like he just kept getting worse every day. I thought it was, we were losing him slowly. They kept him in a medically induced coma for over five weeks. It's just not fair. This should never have happened. We should not be sitting here right now. What did my son do to them? The SWAT team was hunting for this man who police say sold meth to a confidential informant outside the home where the family was staying. Problem was the suspect lived across town. They raided the wrong house because they did not do their job. Toddler burned by a flash grenade while landed in his playpen in the SWAT raid that critically hurt a little boy. Two days later, the man in charge of the raid, Habersham County Sheriff Joey Terrell, went public. We just knew there wasn't children in there. We, we had our mind set on what the game plan was to go in and do it. Odd, since the phone seven say they'd been living there with their kids for two months. If they would have done their job at all, any kind of surveillance, they would have known that their suspect did not live there right. and that there were plenty of children in that house. According to Alicia, the family's Whatever. minivan was parked in the driveway with their four car seats in it. Even with the door closed? You can still see car seats. And decals on the back window showing three children and a stroller. So this is the door. This is the actual door right here. Still has the damages. Marcus Coleman is a local community activist. So they busted through here, yes, tossed sir. the grenade in. Yes, he sir. took us into the converted garage where the family slept that night. They say under the glow of a giant flat screen TV, they used as a nightlight. Cartoons were on. I believe they were. Any due diligence of police work before coming in in such a militarized fashion 
would have prevented this tragedy. So we've come here to the Habersham County Sheriff's Office to get some answers from the sheriff himself. Sheriff, good morning. He's a big man with little to say. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about the Von Savin family. I can't answer any uh, under advice of counsel. Clearly there was a tragic mistake. You know. I'm not going to get off on tactics with you. I'm not going to get off in the weeds on it. I'm not going to talk about what happened. A lot of weeds now. here, huh? There's, oh, there's tons of weeds. Have the tactics changed? We've examined everything we do. Um, you know, we've trained with other teams. Um, and there's not going to be a real good answer to that one, is there? Um, Since we couldn't find answers in Habersham County, Georgia, we found a SWAT team in Florida to demonstrate how to safely deploy a flashbang grenade. Here's on the search war! This is what it looks like being face to flesh. Where's the time and place for it? You know, we don't we don't use it very often. We went back to Georgia, where Habersham District Attorney Brian Rickman convened a grand jury to look into the botched raid. But as in the recent cases in Ferguson, Missouri, and Staten Island, New York, which sparked protests across the nation, the citizens of Habersham County found no grounds to charge any of the officers involved with a crime. If you are responsible for a flashbang and you deploy that flashbang into a pack and play and nearly kill an 18 month old toddler, how is that not criminally negligent? If we had any evidence that they knew the pack and play was there, you're in the criminal sector there. Good information such as a minivan with four car seats right in front of the front door? That's a good point. But once those SWAT team guys are out of the car, once that point of no return is passed, it's not criminally negligent for them to not have investigated that van. But the Broward SWAT team says there's no such thing as a point of no return. They are specifically prohibited from deploying a flashbang if there's any sign of children. Have you ever had to not deploy, not throw the yes, sir. The device? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. So no bang. We'll say, hey, uh, we're not deploying, we're not deploying. And we'll take remove ourselves from the situation. When you deploy it and it fires, is it supposed to hit skin or flesh? No. Is it supposed to touch anyone? No. Do you think anybody from that SWAT team did anything wrong? There were mistakes made. The intelligence on the front end is, is how the tragedy could have been avoided. That intelligence was gathered by a drug unit that was disbanded just one day after we rolled into town and confronted Sheriff Terrell. And guess who oversees that unit's budget? Sheriff Terrell and DA Rickman, among others. I mean, you're involved intimately in the workings of this unit. It seems like a conflict of interest. It's not a legal conflict of interest. Four years ago, undercover officers in the same drug unit shot and killed unarmed pastor Jonathan Ayers at this gas station. Earlier this year, his pregnant widow was awarded $2.3 million in a wrongful death suit. And guess who convened the grand jury in that case? Were there any criminal charges after the Pastor Ayers shooting? With respect to the death, there were no criminal charges. So no criminal charges there and no criminal charges with respect to the Phone 7 case? That's correct. Sure is easy for law enforcement to hurt people and get away with it in that area, isn't it? Is that a question or? Yeah, that's a question. Are there any repercussions for law enforcement officials and officers who are involved in seriously injuring someone or killing them in your jurisdiction? Yes. Criminal repercussions? Uh, nobody went to jail. Why can't they just say, I'm sorry, we messed up, we're going to make things right? Has the sheriff or anybody from Habersham County ever apologized? No. Has anybody ever called you to say we're sorry? We have not received any phone calls. No cards, no teddy bears, no balloons, no nothing on Boo Boo's behalf at all. After nearly six weeks, Boo Boo toddled out of the hospital with more than $800,000 in medical bills, which Habersham County refused to pay. And before this, we had no debt. We didn't owe anybody anything. And now after all this, you know, they have completely financially crippled us. We've decided to crash the Habersham County Board of Commissioners meeting. 
try to get some answers from the folks here about why it is that they refuse to pay for any of the family's substantial medical bills. We corner county manager Philip Sutton. It is not legal for the county to authorize payments for the medical bills. And this is a family that nearly lost their son. His face was nearly blown apart. A hole okay, was created. I can't discuss this anymore. Well, I'm just asking. The sheriff said, quote, send the bills to the county. The sheriff can't make a commitment like that. So much. The phone savants buckling under medical bills, now topping a million dollars, are planning to sue the county, struggling every day. But today, at least for a few hours, there's some Christmas cheer. At least we're having a good Christmas. With new toys, a twinkling tree, and a little boy grinning again. So our question here tonight, who do you think should be responsible for the baby's medical bills? Let us know on Facebook and Twitter and use the hashtag ABC2020. And if you would like to help the Ponsuvan family, you can find more information at our website, abcnews.com. And by the way, those gifts and toys that you saw Matt bring to them were all donated by our parent company, Disney, and the Marine Toys for Tots Foundation. We'll be right back. Mean one. They're being naughty, not nice. Christmas culprits stealing presents off your porch. So your kids' Christmas gifts. Correct. That is low down. But the real shocker? Driving a BMW as the getaway car. People call to the Grinch. Make that Mrs. Grinch. Why did you take those packages? When we come back. Well, this is something. This holiday, if you see someone rush up onto your porch, it won't necessarily be to leave a present, but to take one. Robberies are, in fact, on the rise. Everything from U-Hauls to BMWs being used to haul away the loot. Once again, Matt Gutman looking at a different kind of holiday gift grab. It's that most wonderful time of the year. The holiday greetings, the cookies left for Santa, the presents under the tree, and... Grinches lurking nearby. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. This season, over 1.3 billion packages will be shipped, and every year the halls are decked with new faces of crooked criminals swiping holiday cheer right off your front porch, taking advantage of your online shopping to fill their stockings. Just this week, video released of a Scrooge in Baton Rouge taking one family's Christmas delivery. In San Diego, this woman even brought a U-Haul. Yes, a U-Haul to haul off her stolen loot. There's this guy in Maryland, this guy in Texas, and our favorite of the season, this woman in West Virginia peeking in the door, trying the handle, and casually swiping holiday packages right off Ryan and Marty Ruth's doorstep. What was in the packages? It was a soccer ball and some plastic cars. So your kids' Christmas gifts? Correct. That is low down. But she didn't stop at the toys. She actually grabs the wreath right off the front door. I mean, the lady took your wreath. <laughs> That's just crazy. Who takes a wreath? It's funny now, but I probably could have killed her then. <laughs> yeah. Starting in about early part of October, where we start seeing a, an increase in the number of packages that are reported stolen. Detective John Bennett of the Washington County Sheriff's Office says these crimes are so popular because they're so easy to pull off. It's a total opportunity crime. Run up to the porch, grab the package. It's a matter of seconds. And this year has been busier than ever for his department because of this stolen bicycle. Police tracked it to this house and got a big surprise. They found uh, many, many items that they believe to be stolen packages. Over 100 packages in all. We have a little Bluetooth speaker. Many of the items that were still in the, the actual shipping box had addresses and names that, that didn't belong to that address or anyone associated to that address. And now, just in time for Christmas, Detective Bennett is taking on a new role. Hello, how are you? One that usually comes with a red suit and a beard. Good, how are you? So one of my favorite things to do is to return property to people that, guys that have had it stolen from them. Especially this time of year, feel a little bit like Santa. Thank you. Oh, oh. It's, it's like an early Christmas gift. Our kids really need this, so yeah. That's great. Thank you. He's just one of the people fighting back against pesky package pilferers. 
Back in West Virginia, Ryan Ruth coupled the power of surveillance cameras with social media to take down his unlikely screw. She came here, took packages, went back to the car, did another round, took the wreath, and then went back downstairs, down the hill. Uh-huh. Yes. To Correct. the back door of your house. Correct. Yes. And this is the second camera. Thanks to that high-tech security system that includes four cameras around his house, Ryan was able to go straight to the videotape. There it is. Yep, here it is. And then while I'm watching this, I see the footsteps. I'm just expecting to see a guy here. And you see it's a female, obviously. And then you see she goes out to the driveway, puts the packages in the trunk of her BMW. That's right, the getaway car, a Beamer. You don't expect someone to pull up with a BMW. Well-dressed, uh, older lady. Right, the color of her hair, the color of the wreath, the packages, it's all so bright and clear. Yes. Well, I was like, she just had her highlights done. Ryan took to social media to show those highlights off to a much wider audience. I knew if we put this on Facebook, someone would know who it was. And sure enough, I put it on there Tuesday morning. By Tuesday night, we basically had her name. How many views did you get that day? Uh, it was around a half a million. Yeah. Wow. In one day. Ryan Ruth and his family were out of town for Thanksgiving. And the story got so much attention online and in the local media that within 24 hours, 63-year-old Deborah Davis turned herself in to police. She comes down, she talks to us, and she says that it was a prank. But they got the wrong house. But police quickly determined that her story was a lie, and they found something else out, too. She also went outside around the house and said she urinated in the bushes? Yes, she, uh, she said that she needed to use the restroom and she was trying to get inside the house for that purpose. So that explains why she tried to try the handle both in the front and the back. That's what she said. Deborah Davis was arrested and charged with attempted burglary and petty larceny. And the Ruths say they want to see her behind bars. I think she does need some something for a wake-up call to say, hey, you cannot do this. She ended up becoming probably the most infamous suspect in all of West Virginia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, people called her the Grinch. Well, I think it was the wreath. <laughs> It was the wreath. Yeah, a lot, a lot of the face. It really smarts her, the wreath. It is. You can't get over that. No, yeah. I cannot. <laughs> we wanted to know what turned Deborah Davis into a Grinch, so we paid her a visit at her tastefully decorated colonial. Note her festive wreath right there. Davis, this is Matt Gutman from ABC News 2020. I can hear you talking to the dogs behind the door. Why did you take those packages? Why did you take the wreath? Maybe the dogs know. Davis has returned the Ruth's family packages, and they're now wrapped up safely under the tree. And best of all for Marty Ruth, her wreath is back where it belongs. Don't mess with this lady's wreath. Exactly. Right. Next, and the Bah Humbug Award goes to this guy. When they didn't like his lights, he declared war with a nightmare Christmas. You're a prisoner on your own street. But it's no silent night when we go after him. Hey, Bill. When 2020 returns. Some towns attract big crowds for their incredible Christmas decorations, but here's the Christmas story you haven't seen before. A nasty neighbor wrecking the halls instead of decking them. It's so bad, one neighbor even called it the Christmas from hell, and you have to see it to believe it. Here's Deborah Roberts with the town that got scrooged. Was the week before Christmas and all through the night, the glow of homes blanketed with lights, lights, lights. Here comes Santa Claus. Here Bright, comes Santa dazzling Claus. excess. It may seem over the top, unless you've been to this neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the home of the modern day Scrooge on Fairley Road. Ah, uh, a book. He's an angry person. Any opportunity he has to make our life a hardship. He does. He is Bill Ansel, an electrician by day who neighbors say uses his skills to terrorize them at night, all year long. Take a look at his holiday horror display, a beheaded choir, a hanging Mickey Mouse. Even the jolly old man is being naughty, not nice. And the Santa, the urinating Santa, does that, actually, does that, that actually stopped. work? Yes, at night? it lights up at night. 
Chris and Joanne Hebda have been staring at this Nightmare Before Christmas display every day for the last six years because Fairley Road is a circular street with Bill's house smack in the middle. So there's no sense of peace here at all. He gives new definition to the word relentless. It almost sounds like you're a hostage in your own home. Exactly. The Hebdas moved here 30 years ago, thinking it was a happy place to raise their kids. Their neighbors did too, until Ansel went all bah humbug on them. Tacked up all over his house are profane, personalized signs attacking both the township and the neighbors. How many of you have been the target of these vulgar signs? Show of hands. I believe everybody has. has. What is the worst thing he said in these signs? We can't even repeat it. In fact, some are so perverse, we can't even show them to you. This heartless message turned up the day after Tom White's wife died. Why would somebody even do that? We wondered the same thing until we stumbled upon kind of the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah. This display is dedicated to Ross Township. Shame on you for destroying my display that brought so much joy and happiness to so many people. Yes, it seems that years ago, before all this darkness, there was light, bright lights, Christmas lights. Who guessed that this happy holiday home was Bill Ansel's? Turns out he was a Christmas fanatic. But one Thanksgiving, neighbor Pam Heck asked Bill to tone it down a little while her family had dinner. It was uh, very unpleasant between us after that. And it went downhill from there. Mm -hmm. That was the moment this Christmas tale took a twisted turn. I used to have a beautiful Christmas display. They hated it. This is my display now. I don't think it's against a lot of exercise your right to have your own display. So Ansel decided to deck the halls with boughs of hatred, replacing his twinkling lights with floodlights, blasting them nightly into his neighbor's windows. It'll be three o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden you'll hear bang, 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 and he's underneath a tarp with a sledgehammer, hammering in the middle of the night to wake up the entire neighborhood. They're trapped. Friends and family won't visit, and they can't even sell their homes. You're a prisoner on your own street. It can come down to a matter just a leave the house empty and move. Pam says the stress of it all even led to her divorce. It was a strain every day. I would always be saying, stand up for me, do something. He's almost hit me today, you know, with his car. The residents of Fairley Road are at their wits' end. They say they've called police dozens of times, filed multiple lawsuits against Ansel, even tried killing him with kindness. We would take pies over to him. And then he threw the pies on the street afterwards. Now even the mere sight of her neighbor strikes fear in Joanne Hebda. Oh, there he is. He's coming up. We tried approaching Ansel's home. Hello? Were you just going to ask you a couple of questions, Bill? You want to have anything to say? Hey, Bill? And he clearly means it. The sign says he'll shoot. Bill, it's Deborah Roberts from ABC News. Can I talk to you? His only response was this. Ansel was in no mood to talk. Bill? But has the town made any attempt to do anything? Not to our knowledge. We asked them to enforce the code, but so far, it hasn't been done. They say the town's done nothing more than fine Ansel, but in a statement, Ross Township told us they've taken and will continue to take appropriate legal action. The court order is to clean the debris up um, in the yard. In reply, Ansel simply ignored the court order. And unlike Ebenezer Scrooge, there's no happy ending, no Christmas miracle in sight for Fairley Road. We decided that we would rent our home for probably way lower than it should be. Is it going to be a financial hardship trying to yeah, get out? Oh, yes, it will. It's a move for our lives, you know, to have normalcy again. Can you still enjoy the season? You have to go somewhere else. Yeah, you have to go somewhere else. <laughs> So when everything else has failed, what would you do if your neighbor just said bah humbug and ruined your Christmas? Let us know on Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. I don't think I'd be too happy no. about it. But don't go away. When we come back, a mother finally able to spend Christmas with her family, her five children, for the first time in seven years. Where has she been? Find out when we return. Imagine having five children and you've missed their birthdays for the past seven years, missed all their Christmases too. What kind of mother would do that and where was she all that time? Well, it's not what you think. I just want to hug my kids. 
A wife and mother released from life in prison after seven years. Our cameras there. In the stunning case, 2020 has followed from the very beginning. I'm looking for that. A four-year-old with an insatiable appetite for anything. He ate a dozen and a half eggs until one day. He stopped breathing. I, I did CPR. Was it murder by force feeding? You're sitting there watching this child die, and you don't do anything. How do you do that? Was his mother to blame? I think she was angry and enraged with wanting to punish him. Or was it all a bizarre medical mystery? It's somebody's worst nightmare. Somebody thinks it's your fault. The twists in the case and the prosecutor in the hot seat herself. I cannot remember. I do not remember. I don't recall. I don't know. I, I don't remember. I don't understand how anybody could do the things that she's done. Sleep well at night. How a mother of five came home for the holidays. How do you catch up on seven years? I don't know. I don't know if you can. It's an incredible story, and you can see it all next week right here on 2021 Family's Extraordinary Holiday Gift. Elizabeth and I will be right back. That's our program for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Elizabeth Vargas. And I'm David Muir from all of us here at ABC News in 2020. We wish you a happy Hanukkah and good luck this weekend getting ready for Christmas. We need it. We need to start, right? <laughs> Have a good night. Should we do that?